about halfway through. Okay, cool. All right, let's see if this works. Hey, how's it going, everybody? This is Greg Brown from Foundry. And again, sorry for the technical difficulties. It's ironic because uh, 10 minutes before we started this, uh, we were talking about um, waiting for Zoom updates. And it looks like all my <laughs> settings have changed. And so hopefully you guys are getting this. And if anybody on here can verify that the stream is coming through on the resulting page, that would also be helpful. Because mm -hmm. also, uh, YouTube is telling me there's an error, but it's still showing the video. So I'm kind of thinking... I think we disagree on what an error is. <laughs> All righty. But we have a very exciting live stream today. Um, we have Hideki Masuda and John Bavaresco here with us to do a presentation on Moto in education and how they use Moto, and what students' reception to Moto is. And uh, these are two artists that, who I have a lot of respect for, excellent educators, and a presentation I am very excited to see. So since we've had you guys waiting for so long, you've been so patient, thank you again for that. Let's go ahead and get rolling. So uh, John or Hideki, whichever of you want to share your presentation. Uh, I'll let Hideki take the lead. There we go. Can you see? The... I see it just fine. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, uh, Greg, for uh, inviting us to speak uh, at your event. Uh, so today, uh, I'd like to talk about the model at uh, our school. Uh, we are uh, at the Academy of Art University uh, School of Industrial Design. We started to use model about, um, I would say, five years ago. Uh, and uh, my name is Hideki. I am the director of the School of Industrial Design, and I take care of the online side of the business. So, um, and John uh, is our part-time adjunct faculty member. We're very uh, fortunate to have John uh, work uh, with our students and creating courses and uh, teaching the courses that he made. So a uh, little bit about uh, Academy. Uh, Academy has been around since 1929, and uh, it started in San Francisco, and we are still in San Francisco. Uh, but uh, about 18 years ago, I think 2004, uh, the president made an announcement to start online education, and uh, she wanted to have everything, all degree uh, programs in online modality. So since that announcement, uh, well, I've been working as an uh, online coordinator, and then uh, I was uh, promoted as a director at some point. But um, um, the reason I'm talking about this is uh, because I started to, uh, I had to look into different 3D modeling software uh, for the online modality. Uh, initial directive from the president was uh, to mirror the on-site education in the online format. And there was a good reason for it. Uh, basically, the accreditation uh, is governing what we teach and how we teach uh, to a certain uh, degree. And if we change the program or curriculum, we had to be re-accredited. So it, it made sense to, so, so to speak, mirror the program in online modality. Uh, but it was challenging. Uh, many of you might, might know what industrial design education entails. And I'll flip through some of the random images that I uh, uh, gathered for this presentation. Um, but um, in uh, industrial design, um, part of what we do, uh, we did and still do is creating uh, precise model, physical model of what we designed. Okay, we start with sketching and uh, we do have digital 3D modeling. Um, here's an example of um, uh, sketches and uh, turning into quick uh, sketch models we call uh, in digital format. Uh, we do this type of stuff in uh, traditional model making facility as well uh, using uh, polyurethane form. So, but for the online modality, as you can imagine, having a complete workshop at home is a challenge or you know, for remote students, having an access to model making facility is quite a challenge. And that was creating a bottleneck for the, uh, uh, the program. 
So once I uh, achieved or met the directive uh, mirroring the curriculum uh, in online on site modality into online, uh, I I had opportunity to meet the uh, accreditor of the school and then uh, talked about what I wanted to do, which was instead of having traditional uh, model making courses, it it makes sense to do it digitally. So that's when I started to look into um, different types of 3D modeling software. Uh, and um, we had, I have been teaching, using and teaching um, ADIAS for over 20 years since mid nineties. But I had a little bit of uh, discomfort with the uh, you know, nervous modeling in general, because as you know, once you make a model, and even if you want to make a small adjustment, it pretty much have to build entire half or entire portion of the product. And that was quite uh, time consuming. So uh, I encountered model, um, I think it was somewhere around 2015 uh, at the LA Auto Show, uh, there's a designer's night and Foundry was um, probably sponsoring that designer's night. Uh, and there was a person standing there and with the monitor uh, displaying uh, examples of model, um, uh, 3D models. So that was um, my first encounter uh, in person. And then, uh, um, you know, among other 3D software, I tried like a ZBrush, uh, Mudbox, uh, Maya, and so forth. Um, model was most intuitive and, uh, you know, therefore it, it felt really comfortable compared to the others. So that's how I made a decision to incorporate model into our curriculum. Um, so I'm just flipping through the images here. Uh, so we still have the traditional model making facility. Uh, we have array of small, um, 3D printers, and in the back, we can see a little bit, but that's the traditional model making workshop um, with tables all and so on, whatnot. Um, our computer lab is all uh, equipped with the Wacom tablet, and we do both uh, digital work and um, analog work. You can see that the students sketching in digital, but you can probably see a little bit of uh, uh, paper sketches uh, in the background. So sketching is a really important aspect of uh, industry design because uh, it is probably one of the most efficient way to express what you're thinking on the paper and visually communicate with the others. Oh, by the way, uh, please, uh, is, if you have any questions, please uh, interrupt me. Uh, so this is a class that I made. Uh, it, it's called Digital Development of Forms. And this is a online specific course. Like I said, um, for the on-site course, uh, there is development of form, uh, but they use traditional shop and uh, the traditional media like uh, wood, uh, clay, uh, form, and so forth. Um, so, in, and this is a freshman course, freshman level course, and there's no prerequisite. So anyone at the school is welcome to take this course. And um, it is set up uh, to, as the title suggests, to learn how to develop forms and how to be creative about coming up with forms. And um, you know, first week, uh, of course, we have to uh, learn how to use model in terms of UI and uh, you know, UI navigation, uh, and then start with very basics like making primitives and uh, transforming them, moving, uh, rotating, and scaling them. And then the assignment for that week is just assemble primitives and uh, make recognizable form, right? So someone could be making airplane like this or uh, some student may do game control or, or you know, something really uh, uh, simple and they're familiar with. Then second week, we get into bevel tool, probably one of the most uh, you know, used tool in model. Um, 
And uh, we go into a little bit more controlled forms like uh, stemware and making cups. So as you can imagine, uh, most of these items can be made using bevel. Uh, I think we, we cover a bridge to make that handle. But uh, also we start teaching the uh, uh, material application and uh, uh, rendering. And to students, this is the part that they get really excited. You know, this is only the second week into using the software, but they are able to produce this type of photorealistic rendering. And that's kind of you know, unheard of. You know, if you are learning solid modeling or uh, nervous modeling software. So it is a great uh, you know, tool. Rendering is a great tool to get student buy-in. And we continue on to the third week and uh, we cover a little bit more uh, additional tools like getting into fall-offs and uh, getting into more materials and so forth. And this is uh, one of my current students' work. Uh, around fourth week, he can do all of this uh, in Modo. And uh, again, we couldn't do this in nervous software. Uh, the learning curve is much lower in nerves. And in Modo, the learning curve is so steep. And um, with few basic tools, uh, it allows students to create something this high quality. So. And that's why, you know, that's the main reason why uh, I wanted to incorporate model into our curriculum. Then um, we start uh, going into more of a creativity aspect. And then uh, I, I give uh, assignments like okay, um, Bent as a form language. And I show tool, like this Bent tool. And I hope uh, you can see that there's bent feature in this uh, chair design. And the way this one was created is you know, starting with a simple cube and elongating it to make it a slab and just bending a few locations. Like, you know, there's a bend here, another bend and three bend to make the overall form and just using bevel to grow that uh, front leg for that. So again, for model users, it's pretty simple. Um, thing to do um, but uh, for someone who who's fairly new to model and you know have used nervous modeling for over 20 years being able to create this model in just a matter of a few minutes is an amazing experience so more about uh, creativity uh, cut is a form language here and um, um, student make a solid shape, but then uh, making this cut element. And depending on how you organize that cut element, uh, you know, this might communicate more of a uh, stuck or pinched, right? And this one might communicate balance. Uh, and also it might communicate that, um, you know, the base is slightly um, flexible while the sphere is, a um, little bit heavy. Uh, so those are the four languages that uh, you know, we like students to recognize, um, to express uh, what the form is communicating. And this one uh, has words in it and it might communicate forced, but at the same time, this base is a lot softer compared to the others. So that's what uh, we're trying to express and differentiate um, and control people's perception of what they see. Moving on, uh, we go into a uh, form language of layered. And at this point, um, we cover um, different uh, array tools. And also we go into lighting, uh, adding, uh, uh, placing additional lighting in the scene. So uh, the assignment is for students to incorporate language of layers and uh, create lighting. So this is another student's work example. And the next one um, is a development of how, the one in the middle, but this student wanted to tilt those uh, you know, disks and have bracket and that bracket, uh, it's difficult to see, but uh, that's, this is where we start using mesh fusion, uh, another powerful feature uh, that model offers. Um, 
So this is an, another uh, assignment. And it's a magnifying glass, and we might just, you know, not think too much of it. But significance of this model is that uh, in the handle. So in this assignment, uh, we are requiring students to restructure the mesh to run diagonally to place these elements, uh, design elements that can be only achieved by diagonally arranged mesh structure. And once again, you know, if I try to make this model using nervous software, I might have to intersect a bunch of spheres into a cylinder and make all these dimples or a raised surface and use quite a bit of um, in shader uh, technique to achieve this look. But again, um, we cannot forget this is only like fifth week uh, or six weeks into learning the model uh, for students to be able to create uh, this complex model. Now for model users, uh, it may not be you know, such a big deal, but uh, again, for new students, it, it is quite a bit of achievement. Now, the final project um, is we are taking it a little bit uh, of an um, abstract approach in this class. So we start the project with uh, adjective. So this student uh, wanted to do tough image. So the question is, what does tough mean? And they go into an analyzing what tough could mean. It could be uh, durable. It could be masculine and so forth. And he said, okay, tough as bear. He had photographs of bear as an inspiration. And then uh, first step is to make that uh, base form to express the shape of bear. From there, um, students are uh, morphing that form. And in this case, he's uh, adding motion and perhaps speed. So he's making it faster and faster. And he, he ends up, making a motorcycle shape. So uh, usually, as you can imagine, uh, if you're designing a motorcycle, you're told to design motorcycle, right? And the uh, end result is kind of imaginable. But in this case, like I said, we're taking um, abstract approach and student didn't know what they're gonna end up with. And because of the process, it, students, end up creating this unique form for a motorcycle that we are not so used to seeing. Now, some student went back to the base form and he just deleted many of the polygons and applied thicken to make this, uh, this model. Then he decided, okay, I'm gonna make a table. So he wanted to, uh, he changed all the size to uh, flat uh, planar surfaces. And then at this point, student said, okay, uh, it, it kind of lost that toughness uh, and you know, went through the analysis, why that is. And it's in the, uh, the proportion and posture. So he lowers it to get a little bit more aggressive posture. Uh, it almost feels like bear is ready to attack, uh, and, but it is a table. So again, um, as a table, it has a unique feature. As an industrial design um, product, uh, it can be constructed with sheet metal. So, so again, uh, the question is, if we didn't go through that creative process uh, using model and being able to modify the form very easily, could, could he come up with this form? And, the answer is probably not. So model is definitely a creative tool uh, in our field. And the way we've been, we're using, uh, this is another project. Uh, this is not a model model uh, rendered. It's an actual photo of Octopus. Uh, di different student, uh, same final project, starting with um, inspirational images, uh, making base form. He made uh, this chair uh, and table so we can totally imagine this being in a uh, public place like, uh, you know, some parks, theme parks, uh, aquarium, and so forth. Uh, he wanted to do something else, so he made it into this fan shape um, and did a little adjustment and uh, made it into 
a little bit more realistic representation of what the product could look like. Another one uh, he tried was uh, he wanted to curl up those legs or the tentacles and applied twisted foam language. And then um, he started to see that it can be a lamp. Um, so he adjusted the proportions and applied material and lighting inside to, to represent what, he, what it could be as a pendant lamp. Another student's work, uh, his theme was birds on the move. Made very quickly made this uh, bird like shape. Uh, probably all of you can tell that uh, it was made from a single polygon uh, sphere. Uh, I should say single surface uh, sphere. Um, this one was a uh, mesh fusion, uh, cone and spheres uh, combined. Uh, and both represents a uh, form of birds. And the first one, he turned it into kids' uh, rocking toy. And the second one, he turned it into lighting. Um, and it's not too successful. Uh, he realized that he, his theme is birds on the move, but which part of these are moving? Like perhaps the rocking motion is the only movement that we feel right, from the product. But then he revisited the uh, you know, original concept and he realized that when birds move, they fly. That's the uniqueness of the bird. So he made additional form, um, more tessellated and have the wings spread apart like so. Then he did more study, subtle uh, development and opening up the body uh, a little bit. And he's incorporating uh, tessellated and uh, origami uh, form language in this case. And then he started to see an opportunity to make it into lighting. So that this is his end product. So he ends up this beautiful uh, chandelier. And he was very thoughtful to make it uh, not a direct lighting, but uh, all um, indirect lighting. So this is another view. But anyway, so I'll pass it on to John now. Uh, let me stop share. So in, in this, my class, we use model as a tool to explore many uh, form uh, variances uh, very quickly. Uh, and to us, model is a creative tool, uh, which is really important at the very beginning of the design process for uh, designers to first sketch up something real quick, and then from there, make a base form and being able to modify the form to, um, um, one is exploring on expanding more, but also refining the design. So that's where model really shines. And of course the rendering is extremely high quality. Uh, so um, in my opinion, in academic setting, uh, model can pretty much do everything that a uh, student need to do uh, on top of the uh, sketching. And like I said, uh, for the online student or remote student, it, it's great because uh, basically model is a model making studio and photo studio in one package. Anyway, uh, John, please. Oh, uh, that'd be, but really quickly, Hideki, that was a fantastic presentation. Um, thank you for showing that. And I, I love uh, your, the way that you describe, I guess, more or less introducing students into thinking about form and how to kind of release the thinking about form. And it's yeah. kind of funny. I couldn't, like in the beginning, I couldn't help but think of uh, Richard Serra's verb list. Are you familiar with that? Nope. <laughs> Okay. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Richard, Richard Serra yeah. is an installation artist, you know, a fairly famous installation artist. And he came up with this verb list of all the, uh, all the actions that you would do as an artist. And it's something that in designing Moto, I've been kind of thinking about is like, we kind of need a verb list of the actions you perform in Moto and how that relates to form. And so, um, yeah, I can help but think of that in the beginning, beginning of your presentation. But uh, we also had a few comments from people um, asking if this was student work. They didn't know if it yes, was student the, work or not. What I, <laughs> what I showed, everything I showed today is uh, students' work. And um, important yes. note, they are uh, the first time model users and only a few weeks into uh, learning model. 
that is absolutely phenomenal. And so, I mean, they were able to get up to speed with Moto quickly. Yes. And, uh, you know, and like one of the things I always liked about Moto is the, the ability for rapid iteration, just the way that, you know, modeling and the direct modeling in particular is engineered that you just keep on. Uh, I think as, as Brad used to say, you just, you throw stuff at the wall until it sticks, right? You yeah. keep on iterating until you find that shape that you really like. Yeah. And yeah. I didn't, I didn't mention it, but, uh, you know, before the final project, uh, students are also introduced to procedural modeling and also um, a schematic uh, workspace. So, you know, we, we cover uh, starting with lines and uh, using, uh, um, create setups where it, it, it is a product form already. Uh, we do work on remote, but remote form, but uh, you know, by just adjusting the curves, the entire shape changes. Um, so that's really powerful too. And students see great, um, you know, possibility uh, moving forward in the design courses that they can really create design variances very quickly. Very yeah. cool. Um, and William, I, uh, you, you have a question, I believe, right? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, beautiful work. Um, I, I'm just curious to hear what, what kind of impact have you seen with the introduction of, of 3D, like Moto and 3D into this workflow um, where it is online versus being in a, you know, being in a, a more studio environment? Um, so one obvious aspect is their um, presentation quality have uh, improved quite a bit. Um, uh, you might have, I included some of the uh, renderings from different software in the early portion of the uh, presentation, but uh, the render quality is phenomenal, as you know, in Modo. Uh, so that part is very easy to see. Um, other than that, uh, my hope is that as students get more familiar with the software and uh, how to apply the tools in their creative processes, uh, I am hoping to see uh, you know, higher quality design or more appropriate design for the purpose. Uh, being able to, uh, again, uh, iterate and reiterate different design um, uh, possibilities or explore in, in them. So we hope to you know, start seeing uh, higher quality design as we move forward. Thanks for that. Very cool. Thank you for the, the excellent presentation. Uh, John, are you, uh, are you ready to go? Yeah, are you seeing my screen? We are. Okay, good. And you can hear me, obviously. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, whereas uh, Hideki teaches uh, the principles of design as it uh, can be applied with Moto, I teach uh, two courses that focus predominantly on uh, technique. Um, my goal is to allow the students to learn the software to the point to where they don't have the limitations of designing something uh, that they know they can build. You know, um, I think that was uh, one of the things that uh, when I was going to uh, Art Center, I, I, I realized that uh, going into a wood shop, uh, I was only limited to the type of form and design I felt I could actually execute with those tools. But uh, my goal is to allow uh, the students to uh, understand and have a, uh, a grasp of moto so well that that it's really uh, only limited by their ideas and uh, and not the software. So I teach actually two courses at the school. One is the IND uh, 625, I almost said the other one, uh, and it's poly modeling and form exploration, whereas form exploration is really lower case, uh, whereas I really try to focus on projects that uh, emphasize the tools and workflows of Moto. So, but as it applies to uh, industrial design, um, I have really two different types of students uh, the, in, in each course. Uh, and uh, usually the industrial design students are a little more adept at 3D modeling, or at least have some experience and a little more technically literate, whereas, um, 
uh, uh, fashion design students that I teach for my footwear course um, are a little less, uh, or I should say they're a little more uh, analog, <laughs> if you will. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, so my goal is to be able to uh, have courses uh, or lessons that uh, apply to each one of their type of mindsets so that I can uh, cater to each of their needs. So, um, oh, good. Okay. There we go. Uh, so um, let me let me uh, just kind of tell you a little bit how this works. So there are 15 modules in a semester, and each module is a week. So uh, during that week, we do one project or product. Uh, but occasionally, uh, a project will span uh, two weeks, in which case the student at the end of the first week will submit a work in progress. And it gives me an opportunity to go through that and see that they, uh, if there's any issues that uh, are, are going to bite them in the behind later on. So. Uh, but for the most part, um, the students will execute a, a project within a week span. Uh, within that week, there's uh, videos that they follow, um, approximately anywhere from 15 to 30 video tutorials for that project. Um, and the student will watch and follow along. So um, they do have some degree of creative freedom in that, but um, they, for the most part, they're following along with uh, my lessons so that uh, they can understand the tool sets involved with uh, with building uh, a product of a project of this type. So uh, in my videos last anywhere from three to five minutes. Uh, sorry, William, I can't do that. 60 second thing, but, <laughs> but uh, uh, so they, they can go through though quite a number of uh, videos in a single day, but uh, as is with most students, they like to wait till the weekend. So I'm uh, constantly getting pinged with questions on Saturday night and Sunday. <laughs> But uh, if they do have any questions, they can reach out to me through the uh, LMS and the learning management system of the school, which is very, very good. So uh, the first thing I do is uh, give them a tour of the UI. And uh, we go through uh, basic of a selection and navigation or, or translation, and then uh, viewport navigation, that sort of thing. But we move pretty quickly through this. Um, there's also other resources they can reference if they need to. Um, and I make sure that they have access to that, you know, the help files and whatnot. Uh, I also clue them into uh, uh, William's uh, excellent uh, series of uh, uh, videos that they can access as well. So if they have any uh, questions they can answer on their own. Uh, so, and then uh, we jump right into the projects. We start off with some easy projects, but but again, that projects that apply to, uh, you know, the industrial design uh, uh, theme here. <laughs> so, Graduate students, and this is a uh, graduate program, they often come in with knowledge of other software, such as Alias, Rhino, SolidWorks, et cetera. Um, but uh, a lot of times they, they want to start off with something that is very exacting. They want to try to make their, their, uh, pro, uh, you know, their products perfect at first, like they can in a CAD application. But I am real quick to emphasize that Moto is not about manufacturing. You know, Moto is about uh, ideation and creation, whereas CAD applications are about uh, manufacturing. And I, I, and I stress to them that as a designer, if they get into a, a large facility, um, um, there's rooms full of engineers that will make this happen for them. So they shouldn't worry so much about, uh, you know, the exact nature and the exact uh, uh, measurements, calculations. Their, their job is to create, you know. Uh, so I start them off with simple projects. As you can see in the upper right-hand corner, we do a, a salt shaker. And uh, that is designed to uh, give a feel for subdivision surfaces. And a lot of students have no uh, experience with that. And so they have to understand, uh, you know, the pushing and pulling of, of vertices and that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, they get the idea it's kind of like working with some malleable substance, you know. And the salt shaker was a good, uh, I think is a good product because you go in a single surface, you can go from a cube to a cylinder shape and, uh, and then top it off with a sphere. So it's really some basic elements there and they, they get a real uh, 
feel for uh, subdivision surfaces. Uh, another project that we do is a lounge chair, and that's their introduction to curves and uh, how we can make uh, curves into a, uh, uh, you know, a piece of furniture, as it were. Uh, then we do retopology, which we uh, build a, uh, uh, a container, a uh, detergent container in this case, and they get a feel for uh, how retopology tools work. So as you can see, each of the uh, uh, lessons here uh, actually has a purpose as far as its emphasis on a particular tool. The pen, uh, for example, is, is uh, emphasizing uh, beveling and edge control. And I, I should also state that well, each of my projects, um, I try to let the students take it all the way to a rendering. And uh, I get them started in rendering right away and, uh, and materials application. So we do a lesson on how the shader tree works and functions and uh, how to apply materials and, and understanding the order of the shader stack and all that. So that's very important. Uh, we also do a little bicycle seat, uh, which again, gives them a good feel for use of curves and uh, and uh, fall offs and that sort of thing, and a gear shift handle, which is uh, predominantly a, a fall offs kind of project for them. So each each uh, lesson has a kind of a core tool or workflow that I emphasize, and these are tools that these uh, designers are going to use uh, no matter what they're designing in in Modo. Um, then we jump into Mesh Fusion, which is uh, one of my favorite tools. And in this exercise, uh, I teach them the, uh, the principles of uh, the Boolean operations and uh, what the trim elements are and how they can control the uh, strips, the widths and the shape of the strips. Um, and then, uh, uh, and I, I think I like this particular project uh, mostly because it, it gives a different sort of a look to, to a model beyond subdivision surfaces. It, it, it gives you more of a CAD-like look to your model as far as the surfaces go. And uh, there are a lot of different uh, forms and shapes you can sculpt with, uh, with this. And, and I, do, uh, I do categorize Mesh Fusion as a sculpting tool actually, uh, because you're just adding and subtracting uh, surfaces to your, to your model. And um, so uh, in this, and in this particular exercise that they do is uh, they are free to kind of explore mesh fusion and create some sort of sculptural uh, element of, of any type. And, and again, I'm not teaching form and, uh, and, and design in, and so there's no real specific language that we're trying to achieve other than just to uh, kind of get a handle on the tool, so to speak. All right, then we uh, go into a little deeper exploration of mesh fusion using a, uh, an actual practical model. And this is a guitar project. And uh, the, uh, the advantage of this project is now that they're using mesh fusion as a tool to integrate with existing elements. So uh, they have to uh, kind of figure out how to build a, a guitar body that, uh, <clears throat> that um, will work with some assets that I've already given them, such as the, the neck, the, uh, the bridge and the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the pickups in the knobs. So we usually just riff off of a, uh, a photograph of a, of a, of a guitar uh, without actually using uh, any kind of orthographic uh, drawings or sketches. We just take a, whatever we find on Pinterest or whatever and uh, model that. Um, <clears throat> And that gives them a good, uh, I think, eye-hand coordination and allows them to uh, understand scale and proportion of their, of their product. So you'll notice that a lot of students will start off and they'll model something and it's 40 feet long, you know, it's a chair, you know, and, uh, and they don't, they're not really tuned into um, a scale and proportion just yet, but this, this project, they absolutely have to be. So, um, so yeah, so we use mesh fusion. We can get into some really tight corners and tight spaces and, uh, <clears throat> see, you know, how, uh, how mesh fusion will work with the various tools that it has. So, um, and then they're free to build the guitar of their own. So 
and they come up with some pretty interesting designs and some pretty interesting shapes. Again, uh, students are encouraged to texture everything and uh, render that out. And uh, they're also given a quick lesson on lighting as well, so they don't always use a directional light <laughs> and uh, in their in their uh, renderings. Uh, but yeah, so we have some pretty nice. This is where they get to exercise their their design chops, as it were. So, and this is like I said, this is like one of the funnest projects uh, that uh, that I enjoy. So. All right, so um, then this uh, course, we wrap up with a shoe, of course. <laughs> can't, can't not do a shoe. <clears throat> so um, uh, here we have uh, some examples of a uh, shoe that we build over on top of the last. And this is a retopology type of technique that we're using. And uh, uh, finally, uh, one of the quotes from one of my students is that I'm really liking this final project. I never had much interest in designing footwear, but finding out that shoes are darn fun to model. And they are. So, <laughs> all right. All right. So the uh, next course I teach is uh, shoe specific. specific. Um, it's uh, footwear and soft goods modeling, if you can see. And uh, this course, we have students that are uh, very um, green as far as uh, their exposure to 3D software. Uh, but as you can see that they, they as you will see, they uh, can execute some quite interesting and uh, really, uh, really nice uh, designs with the, with, uh, with Moto. So uh, anyway, so uh, my approach to, uh, to teaching these students is slightly different. We just dive right in. <laughs> After a quick crash course on uh, on the UI and the navigation, just like I did in the first uh, uh, first course that I taught, we jump right into modeling something. But it's a simple model, and uh, it's uh, just do, doing these flip flops, and they learn a lot of different techniques in Moto from. Uh, <clears throat> from using curves uh, to uh, to generate uh, geometry, to uh, actually punching holes in a surface, uh, uh, you know, bridging, and uh, also uh, uh, displacement mapping and bump mapping as well. So uh, actually, this is just strictly bump mapping here, but uh, yeah, and uh, we I show them how to apply uh, backgrounds to their scenes and uh, do sh uh, uh, shadow. Uh, uh, shadow catcher, as it were, and uh, they really have a lot of fun with this uh, project. So, uh, so yeah, they can really go to town. So, and this is a, a one one of those uh, week long projects that students jump into. Next, we uh, get into something a little more complicated in the following week, and that is a uh, a, a sandal, uh, which is different from a flip flop in that it uh, has a lot more contour to it and a lot more uh, detail. Uh, so. As you can see, we, we jump into doing a lot of displacement mapping on this particular model. But the, again, uh, I'm uh, having the students uh, texture, texture map and light their projects right from the very beginning. So that they have uh, get a handle on that early on. And this is uh, just like Hideki said, uh, they really respond to this because once they see their ideas and their models actually as a, you know, a photo real image in front of them, it uh, really inspires them to move forward even, even more. Um, <clears throat> so with that, um, I oftentimes supply them with an image, a design uh, that they can uh, work with in this case, um, just a shoe that, that I sketched up that the students could do. Now, this is the next level and, and we're not doing uh, laces and tongues and those sort of things right now, but it's a simple slip on sort of shoe. So we use an existing last and uh, we learn how to paint on that last, uh, the, you know, the design that they wanna do. And so uh, we just use the imaging tool to, uh, to uh, uh, sort of stamp an image onto the model and so that they can uh, use that as a guide for their for their uh, various surfaces. So, and uh, from there we go into the actual modeling process. You know the retopology, and uh, we learn how to use the stitching tool. And they love the stitching tool, <laughs> and uh, and then all the way out to a final product. <clears throat> 
And uh, students get really inspired, like I said, when they start seeing their models and, uh, you know, right, right in front of them as a finished product, uh, something that doesn't exist in reality, but easily could. So, and yeah, so here's another version. And again, we are exploring texturing to a deeper level here. Now we just don't focus on sneakers. <clears throat> we uh, actually look at fashion footwear as well. So in this case, we are uh, taking a last for a, uh, uh, a heel, a fashion heel, and uh, using some sketches and drawings, we're building a, a, uh, a fashion heel. And yeah, and we learn how to do straps. We learn how it's possible to, uh, you know, increase the width as it were on, on an individual strap. And this is a challenging project because the students really have to juggle a lot. If they don't start off clean, there's a lot of uh, repair work that they have to do. So I emphasize, you know, uh, and, and believe me, when I get their projects to grade, even if I'm just looking at a work in progress, I'm really a stickler for details, you know, and, you know, those straps have to be smooth contours all the way around, you know, they can't wiggle or, or, or wave, which, which is, can be problematic because little problems early on can really bite you in the behind later on. So anyway, so uh, we continue on. And as you can see, the students are really getting a handle. And I think this is what the sixth week, I can't remember what project number this is. I think this might be six or something, but yeah, it's not a lot of uh, time that it takes to get to this level, um, as you can see. And uh, materials, again, are also playing a big part. And here, this student has actually added sub, uh, sub, uh, subsurface scattering uh, on their model. And again, this one, this model is actually uh, really built from scratch. Um, we, we do have a last to get this uh, sole contour, but other than a single polygon, really, everything else is is uh, really done from scratch, you know? It's almost something from nothing kind of, kind of uh, lesson here. And then from there, we go into the soft goods part of the course. And uh, this is a handbag uh, based on a Michael Coors design, but it is, uh, uh, the great thing about this project is it teaches the students how to uh, simulate a soft body, uh, you know, made of fabric. And um, they literally have to sculpt the wrinkles into the handbag. So they have to, you know, look up references to see, you know, how that looks like. And I like that because it's kind of old school in a way. We're not relying on software to get the, get the, the bags uh, uh, fabric-y fill. Um, it's all sculpted. Um, and then uh, the other thing that this lesson teaches is how to incorporate hard um, hardware onto a soft body, onto a soft fabric. So you can see we have a zipper uh, and a, you know a zipper pull, and we also have grommets and along with uh, these uh, these links, metal links, and uh, then we have a strap, and everything has to fit together. So it's a lot of work, and you know. I, I don't kid anybody that, you know, once you get into this, um, you really have to pay attention to the details. And this is where they learn that, you know, uh, step uh, cautiously if possible, you know, in the early, in the beginning phase, because it will save you a lot of trouble down the line having to, to fix a lot of stuff. But uh, yeah, so we can see there's a lot of different elements. There's uh, texturing, UV mapping. And that's another thing I didn't mention. Uh, I do uh, teach uh, them how to UV map early on because uh, th that goes part and parcel with texturing. So uh, once they wrap their head around the concept of UV mapping, uh, it's relatively easy to to, to get a hold of, grasp a hold of. But yeah, so you can see there's uh, inner and outer surfaces, uh, there's uh, texturing, there's procedural textures. This is a lot of times uh, some of their first exposure to some of those procedural uh, textures. They also have, uh, get a little taste of um, 
the uh, the text uh, feature in Moto, the generating uh, generating uh, uh, fonts and whatnot. Uh, as you can see, the students uh, brand their products now uh, using Moto's uh, uh, Moto's text tool. So yeah, so that's kind of fun. And then of course they get to light and uh, render out the the model. All right. Uh, let's see. So um, the students have also requested, some of the students uh, will request that they, they bring in a project from another course that they may be uh, learning or involved with uh, to see if they can model their designs in Modo and kind of kill two birds with one stone. Since this is a graduate course and the students are um, at a higher level and uh, this particular student wanted to do a, or was doing a, uh, excuse me, a, uh, a, a pet carrier and uh, in another class and he wanted to see if uh, he could use that in the in the handbag project. Um, I allowed that uh, as long as he adhered to the same uh, modeling processes that we were using for the handbag. Um, and uh, here he came up with a very successful product and uh, even with the uh, the little mesh on top, which I, I showed them how to roll that up. And so he was all excited about that too. So, <laughs> so yeah, so they can uh, literally kill two birds with one stone uh, they, uh, if they want, of course. So anyway, so, and then there's the a little more complicated project here. And we, we are using uh, a different technique. This is the, um, a procedural uh, modeling technique where we use where we're using uh, uh, UV transform to create the various panels on the shoe. I should mention that early on, um, one of the early lessons is uh, the anatomy of a shoe. I call it, and we go through all the various parts of the shoe and what they're called: the little foxing, the saddle, uh, you know, the toe kick. And uh, does anybody know what an aglet is? <laughs> yeah, and that little thing, that little piece at the end of the shoestring, which is kind of floating in the air in this particular model. But yeah, well, sorry There's, to interrupt, but I love that Steve is the only person that raised his hand. <laughs> it's like yeah. I know an aglet. Uh, okay. <laughs> Great. And so, yeah, and uh, they get uh, much more involved uh, with doing the laces and the stitching and making sure that none of the panels are um, intruding on any other panel and we don't have uh, 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 parts that are sinking into other surfaces and that sort of thing. So, yeah, and once that's all done and they get to texture it, and that's when they really that's when they really get excited. You know, uh, at this point, though, in the course, they are really uh, paying much more attention to uh, to detail. And uh, they're getting their cameras in really close and they're under, they're learning all the tricks that the camera can do, like narrow depth of field and all that sort of stuff, which it makes it exciting because now they're, they're not just a designer, they're a product photographer, you know? And uh, yeah. And we also do work on the midsole as well and uh, getting tight with the laces and uh, yeah. So, and, and uh, the students are encouraged to do branding on their shoes, though uh, <laughs> we used to do uh, real branding, but now I've uh, got my hand slapped on that one because uh, <laughs> we don't want uh, these companies to get letters requesting when a particular shoe is going to come out if one of these sort of leaks out. But uh, that looks like a real brand, actually. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so some pretty amazing student work. And of course, uh, wrapping it up here, um, I do uh, teach them a little bit about uh, doing uh, uh, tread work on uh, on the uh, on the tooling. So um, we start off with a, with a basic sketch, and this is their first exposure to mesh fusion, actually. So I show them how to do how to do uh, 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 treads using uh, mesh fusion as a tool. So and it's really really powerful. Um, and then again, displacement mapping, which is another one of my favorite uh, ways of, of working um, you know, with, uh, with treads. And you can do some very interesting, fascinating things, especially if you start masking your, your surfaces. And this is where I show them how they can use material masks or, or uh, 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 masking techniques within materials. Right. 
And every once in a while, a student does something so outrageous that she wins an award. So uh, this wow. is one of my wow. students who won a Global Design Graduate in 2021 winners um, with the for the Gucci Award. And this is Anna Isabel Quintano Noms Kunal, uh, known to us as Belle. <laughs> she was one of my students a couple of years back and uh, went through my course and uh, loved it. And she modeled this uh, mule, they call it a mule, in Moto. And, uh, and she printed it out on the school's printing uh, facilities. And <laughs> I remember when she printed it, the first print she made, she showed me, it was like about as big as a Barbie shoe. <laughs> there was some translation error in the, in the uh, software for the printing, but she got it working and uh, made a really incredible product. So she's a young Brazilian lady and uh, just full of life and those are her kinky boots. <laughs> yeah, so we printed her shoes, uh, uh, these shoes at our facility. And also you can see that, uh, you know, there's a mirror in the middle of the, the sole. So that was laser cut and fitted into that uh, 3D printed mm -hmm. component. So yeah, if student wants to, uh, they can go through this, the same process and make a model, model, export it, and then we, we can help them print them out. We have paint shop, uh, they can paint, you know, do the surface finish and apply paint and do the whole nine yards. Yeah, it's not just all about uh, digital models. I mean, that is that is one step. Uh, being able to take that into creating a physical model is important, and especially in the footwear industry too. Because uh, you know, when I was over at New Balance, they they were they have a huge, you know, as you will know, <laughs> William, they have a huge uh, 3D printing facility there and uh, do uh, prototyping as well with that. But uh, anyway. Um, so that's it for me, um, the School of Industrial Design, the Academy of Art University. I'll let Hadiki take it from here. Yeah, so thank you for your time. And uh, again, thank you for inviting us to share uh, our students' work. So we have all these different disciplines in our, uh, at our school. And, um, you know, model is used in animation and visual effects. Um, you know, industrial design, we definitely are into it. Uh, but as you can see, the list of the disciplines, many of the, uh, the disciplines, they may not be using model right now, but uh, uh, student can benefit from the tool. Uh, it applies to most of, of these uh, disciplines. So I have a plan to make additional courses uh, for our department, uh, focusing on hard surface uh, product design and uh, automotive design. So. And, you know, if you are interested in teaching, please contact us as well. And interested in learning, right? Right. So, yes. so our, our school is unique. So we have inclusive admission policy where uh, for undergraduate degree program, uh, all you have to have is the high school diploma or equivalency. But uh, please don't make a mistake. Uh, it's easy school to get into, but the programs are very vigorous. So once yes. you get to our school, uh, we expect everybody to work really hard to yeah. um, you know, produce high quality portfolio at the end. And uh, we also have personal enrichment program. Uh, I shouldn't say program, personal enrichment, which is basically, uh, there might be some people who are interested in just a few courses, uh, but not really interested in degree program. So that allow people to, maybe some people are in a position where uh, they got degree many years ago, but want to learn a few things to brush up their uh, skills. So that's totally great. And uh, we welcome uh, those people. Uh, we have MA and uh, MFA degree programs. Uh, for those, uh, obviously, uh, people have to have uh, undergraduate degree from somewhere. Uh, but again, um, uh, we are delighted to have uh, any student come to our, stu our uh, school and learn. 
Fantastic presentation. That was really great, guys. I can't thank you enough for that. Um, and, you know, it's it's one of those things like, uh, John, it's it's funny, like when you talk about shoes, you're like, oh, no, we're talking about shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and that's uh, that's something that I, I almost want to uh, address head on in the sense that design as an industry is something that we are very focused on, you know, that we've had a lot of success in. And uh, in shoes, I like as a modeler, it's the thing that, um, is the most challenging for me is modeling the shoes in a way that is actually convincing and look worn, you know, cause it, it, it involves so many disciplines. And so one of the things I'd like, uh, everybody to consider as far as, you know, Moto having this emphasis in the shoe industry, it's actually a good thing because there are so many different disciplines of modeling that are involved in producing a shoe. And it also even drives feature development in good ways. Cause I mean, now this is not something we're working on, but I mean, Hey, Clawson would be very useful with shoes. You know, there's a lot of things that this could drive towards. And you know, I think one of the most, uh, one, one moment, what, one of the most, ahead, ahead, yeah. yeah, one of the most ruthless fur scenes I have ever seen was a shoe. And uh, that was uh, uh, Sergio uh, who used to work with us. That guy made, you know, he had this beautiful suede material. I'm like, how'd you make that material? He's like, oh, it's fur, you know? And so, yeah. I mean, gorgeous fur material. It took a long time for that geocache to complete, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. gorgeous, you know? And so that's how we think about design. And But uh, outside of the design thing and outside of the shoe thing, um, we just want to make sure we start showing you guys more diversity of content. But the shoe industry and design in general, I think, is a very good thing for us to place the emphasis on that we do. And you know, so thank you for showing those great examples. What was interesting is when I was at Honda, I went to lunch with some of the execs there and um, I we were talking about shoes. And one of the execs says, you know, there's a great deal of similarity between cars and shoes. You know? <laughs> and he's right. There really is. You know, when well, it comes I, to design form. Yeah. I mean, I tell people, if you can model a really strong footwear asset, you can model a car, you can model a tank, a spaceship, a character, like it's Absolutely. Like Greg said, it's using all of the same tools and, and techniques and workflows. Yeah. 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 Yep, yep. But we are going to continue to show you guys far more diversity of how Moto is used because I also think that is extremely important. Um, really quickly, I do have a few more things to share with you guys. Uh, um, got some interesting plugins that have shown up. Uh, William shared this with me today. It is super neat. It's called Creative Pie Charts. And so this is something you can purchase on Gumroad, which it would be crazy for me in my newer role not to use this for internal presentations because it's just awesomeness. Uh, so let me go ahead and uh, share everything here. And so check this out. It's Creative Pie Charts, a plugin for Modo that allows you to create these wonderful, you know, pie chart illustrations that, you know, are kind of outside the box thinking for pie charts. And the one that um, stood out the most to me is one you're going to see at the end, uh, which is the polar bear. And it, it really communicates an idea um, brutally well. Um, like, there we go, you know, space between uh, um, green space and, uh, and cities. And so this is a kit you can get. It's $35, uh, at least what I saw on, on Gumroad and absolutely fantastic. Uh, and so definitely worth picking up, I think. And uh, I will be picking it up. And uh, next, I want to show you guys uh, one little thing I've been playing around with uh, in Moto 16.0 that you guys can play around with. Chemo, I am talking sort of directly to you because I think you will have a lot of fun with this or you'll take it much further and do a much better job than I will. Um, but let's go ahead and come on over to Moto. And so, uh, you know, texture cache is really cool. And so texture cache is a, a, a feature we added in 16.0 that basically you see, I've got, you know, one texture in here, just a normal texture. It's actually blank. And what it's doing is it's caching the normal. Now, because it's blank, I'm actually able to kind of on the fly calculate rounded edge width, right? And so the way that I have this set up is I've got my 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 direct modeling mesh item here uh, kind of set up and I can switch over at any time to the variant, which actually has the rounded edge calculated. And so if I go ahead and come over here and just do, you know, a couple simple, you know, bevels and uh, let's go ahead and pull that on out and, uh, oops. There we go. And uh, go ahead and pull that on out. And then 
want to actually see what the result is, I can just come back on over here to the texture cache layer and it will actually, uh, um, or the procedural layer, it actually, there you go. It just finished calculating the rounded edge for me. And then of course I can go ahead and come on over here. And uh, what if I wanted to do um, something else fun? Let's come on over and grab primitive slice and uh, we'll go ahead and pull that right on out and pull that on down. And uh, let's go ahead and make that a subtraction. And uh, now let's go ahead and yank that on over and let's go ahead and make that uh, circular and pull that on down here. So we get an intersection here and drop the tool and then come back over to my procedural stack. And now it's actually recalculating this and I'm calculating it at 1024, the default is 512. Um, but I thought this was really cool. So the second you know, procedural layer I'm pushing this, uh, this primary mesh into, uh, it's just a merge mesh. I wanted to be able to assign a selection set, um, run a UV unwrap on it, assign a material tag so that it gets the right material, of course, and then pack UVs just to clean things up a little bit and does an absolutely fantastic job. And as long as you've set up your hard edges correctly with the material that's being used, which I find the best results are by turning on angle weighting and area weighting to area you get absolutely fantastic results with this. And it's something that is just going on behind the scenes as opposed to specifically having to go in there and rebake that every single time and wait, which I think is, is just extremely, extremely neat. So uh, chemo, I think you should play with that. I think I'll do crazy stuff. Um, and finally, um, Alan, I hope you're okay with me putting you slightly on the spot. It's not a, a story one, but I, I, I was playing around with, some wonderful, brilliant stuff that you were working on this week. And uh, you okay with me maybe showing uh, those, those small example images? Sure. All right. Awesome. Okay. So Alan, as you know, has been working on some really exciting updates to Empath. And so I want to share this. Now, this is very pre-alpha, um, which is also what's part of what's so exciting about it. Um, but let me go ahead and come on over here. Um, what you're looking at right here is um, a, um, a llama or an alpaca or whatever it is. I still don't quite know, but with a lot of fur. And this was done by a user on our forum, Jerka Jaborik, who was kind enough to share this with us. Sorry, Jerka, I took all the styling off because we're doing test renderings. Um, and also right now, or, you know, procedural textures aren't working. They work for controlling the fur, but not actually like gradients and stuff like that on the fur. But this render in empath, which is like, it's, it's very, very dense, fine fur um, on CPU, which is mine is a, a 6850K or something like that. It's a six core CPU that's a little bit old, um, but I have a 3070 Ti also. And for empath on that CPU, this took 97 minutes. And uh, let's go on back here. And this is Empath GPU. Um, and this took three minutes and 20 seconds on a 3070 Ti with eight gigabytes of memory. Now, there are a few little artifacts here, some little NANs here and there, but I, this is the results for me were like, oh, oh, wow, this is impressive. Um, so, Alan, amazing work. I, uh, it was one of those nights that I was like, I just kept on rendering stuff because it was so much fun. And so you guys uh, have that to look forward to at 16.1. This is in development. Now we've got a lot to do for 16.1 and we'll have a lot to do on GPU rendering after 16.1. But for that being pre-alpha results, super, super exciting. I may have to waste money I don't have on a 3090, or at least that's where my irrational thinking is going right now. So thank you guys so much for joining. Thank you to John and Hideki for those wonderful presentations. And uh, the next the next brew o'clock or the next <laughs> the next Moto live stream um, is going to be you know one where we talk about art and it's a little bit more laid back. And the following one after that, we'll have another presentation. And that's kind of the pace we're going to be going on with these for now. So have a great rest of the week. And uh, please uh, you know post your Moto stuff. We wanna we wanna see the amazing things you guys are making. Have a great one. Later. Thank you.